Okay, here we are at chapter 14. This is the first chapter of the last unit. Last unit's just chapters 14 and 15 about uh, temperature and the effects that changing temperature has on uh, various states of matter. We talked about states of matter in the last unit, chapters 12 and 13. Now we're gonna talk about the effect of temperature um, and chapter 15 will then cover some of the um, unique properties of gases and their interaction with temperature and density. But here in chapter 14, we've got all of temperature and heat, which is a very large topic. So this is going to be a long lecture. It's a long chapter, uh, but chapter 15 is relatively short in compensation. <clears throat> so what does it mean for something to be hot? That is the question. Well, um, there have been many different models of heat over the years. Again, science is about models and understanding the world around us in that sense. So in the 1700s, there was this model um, in which heat was represented as an invisible fluid, which they called caloric. And so the idea was that when something hot and cold got in contact with one another, the, the heat fluid, the caloric, would flow from the hot thing into the cold thing, and that would make the hot thing cooler and the cold thing warmer and that was the belief of how things functioned. Um, that was ultimately refuted by a very simple um, experiment, namely the example of friction, and how is it that friction can cause something to heat up and um, continue to heat up if we continue to have friction. Um, a man by the name of Rumford demonstrated this by boring cannons and showing that the cannons get uh, very hot, um, even though we are not heating them directly, we are boring them out via friction. Um, so the caloric theory has gone away, but that term caloric or part of that has been retained as one of our descriptions of a unit of thermal energy called a calorie. So even the models that go away, sometimes parts of them are retained. The modern model is what we call the kinetic molecular theory. The idea that at the molecular level, molecules are moving. They have kinetic energy, they are moving around, uh, bouncing off of one another. So this is really connecting very tightly to what we have learned previously uh, this semester. The idea of kinetic energy, um, which comes from the velocity of an object. Uh, so now we're talking about the kinetic energy of the molecules, though way too small for us to actually see. And the idea is that temperature is uh, measured by the kinetic energy of the actual individual molecules. Uh, it is the average of the kinetic energy of the molecules, something that will uh, be important a little later when we talk about the idea of uh, the difference between boiling and evaporation. So there are a number of different types of energy these molecules can have, and we talk about their energy being their internal energy, for which we use the symbol of U. Um, doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Again, the, the problem is we have a, a limited number of uh, letters in the English alphabet, and we have lots of things in physics that we want to describe. So this internal energy can take several forms. Uh, there's translational kinetic energy. That's what we think of, right? We think of a ball flying across the room. We think of uh, an object rolling across the floor. It's translated. It, it moves from one place to another, just like we would translate an idea from one language to another. The object itself is translated. It is transferred from one place to another. And that's the type of energy that our thermometers can measure, and that's what we consider um, when we consider the temperature of an object. However, there are other types of energy that the molecules can hold as well. The mo molecules can be rotating, they can be spinning around, and that is a type of energy which ultimately can come out of the material but is not measurable uh, with a thermometer, with our traditional me me methods of measuring temperature. And likewise, vibration, you can think of um, a spring and two masses on either end of the spring and the spring kind of um, going back and forth together and apart, together and apart. Um, we have these bonds in the molecules, right, between two different atoms, and those bonds can function as springs and energy can be stored in there. So this is uh, to keep in mind that there are different types of energies and some molecules have all three of these, some only have the top one. It, it really varies quite a bit, and uh, we're going to see that a little later on when we talk about the specific um, heat capacity of different materials. And this slide here and these different types of energy kind of explain why some objects have higher heat capacities and some have lower. 
So in order for the energy to flow between one another, it's not an invisible fluid as in the caloric theorem, but instead it is, again, at that molecular level, the objects are moving. And so a hotter object has faster moving, ob faster moving molecules. <clears throat> and when they collide with the slower moving molecules, we have a momentum transfer and ultimately therefore an energy transfer again so as well so this takes us back to chapter 6 when we talked about momentum when we talked about collisions one of the collisions we talked about was what we called the chase car collision or the slow and fast car collision where both cars are going the same direction but the back car is going faster and so as it speeds up and crashes into the front car it makes the front car go faster and then the back car slows down. So that's what's happening, again, at the molecular level, millions, billions, trillions of times um, as two objects come in physical contact, there's this collision, uh, not only at the surface between the two objects, but then on uh, into the object as that energy gets transferred molecule by molecule into the object. So this is the mechanism by which energy is in fact transferred. So Again, we, when we come up with a model, we have to be able to explain what goes on. And this is the explanation of the kinetic molecular theorem of what is going on to cause hot things to cool down and cold things to warm up when they're in contact with one another. Um, again, if we think about the name, kinetic molecular theorem. Kinetic, there's kinetic energy of the molecules, and this is uh, the theorem of thermal energy that we are currently using. Thermal equilibrium. So again, equilibrium is a big concept in physics, in chemistry, in lots of different parts of science. So we have this equilibrium process occurring lots um, in the thermal world. Um, and that's when two objects get to the point where they both have the same average kinetic energy. They don't, they don't have the same energy necessarily, right? You could have something like um, um, a glass sitting on the counter that's at, at equilibrium with the room, right? My glass is sitting on my kitchen counter. It's at thermal equilibrium with the room. The room's 75 degrees. The glass is 75 degrees. The room has many more molecules, so it has way more total energy than the glass does. But the average energy of the molecules is the same for the glass and for the kitchen. Um, and so if you, if you stuck a thermometer on the glass, if you stuck a thermometer on the kitchen, neither of their temperatures would change. But that doesn't mean there isn't a flow. There is still a flow of energy. It's still going both directions, there's just an equal amount going in both directions. Another way to think about it um, is to think about having a, a classroom or some kind of room that's connected to a hallway by two doors, right? And um, people might come in one or two of the doors and other people might go out the doors. And when the room reaches its capacity relative to the hallway, right? For every person that comes in, somebody else will go out. It's not that nobody enters or leaves the room, it's that the same number enter and leave, and therefore the number of people in the room stays constant. Um, our method of taking temperatures of things is to get a thermal equilibrium between the object that we're interested in and a thermometer. So this is part of the idea of our thermometers being small, very often very small glass tubes, and there's a very small amount of metal in the bulb of that tube. And the idea is to get that little section of the thermometer into thermal equilibrium with whatever material you have put it in and then we can confidently say that whatever temperature the thermometer is is also the temperature of the material that it's in so that's one of the reasons why we stick a thermometer in something and we wait until the thermometer stops moving we're waiting for equilibrium to be established and then we can read the thermometer and know the temperature of the thermometer really when you read a thermometer that's what you're reading the temperature of the thermometer itself but we are making the assumption that the thermometer has reached thermal equilibrium with the material it is in, and therefore the temperature of the thermometer is the temperature of the material. Uh, this is just naturally, I mean, I, I have this little graphic that shows nature loves equilibrium, but, but the reality is this is what's going to happen, right? If there's an imbalance, uh, whatever has more is gonna give to whatever has less. That's just physical properties, physical laws being followed. It's not really a preference or anything. It's just an, uh, the balancing of unequal uh, pressures of whatever type, whether it's actual air pressure or whether it's a difference in, in energy or any of those things, there's going to be this driving effect to um, put more where there is less and get rid of the extra where there is extra. 
Thermal expansion uh, is ultimately how a thermometer works, right? We will talk more about this a little bit later, um, but objects expand when their temperature increases. Um, when you heat up those molecules, they are moving faster. When they are moving faster, they bump into their neighbors more, they push their neighbors away from them a little bit, and the whole thing kind of spreads out, okay? Uh, again, we can think about this in a hot air balloon. You heat up the air in a hot air balloon and it expands and blows up uh, the balloon compartment. Uh, there's lots of examples. And again, we'll, we'll get into this in more detail a little later, but I'm trying to get here to the idea of how a thermometer works and you can't talk about that without uh, this idea of thermal expansion. So whether it's mercury inside the glass tube or alcohol inside the glass tube or whatever liquid we choose, uh, we, we usually do choose a liquid. Um, gases aren't usually visible, so that's not as helpful. And gases tend to expand too much. Solids tend to expand not enough uh, to be easy to, to notice the difference. So we tend to put liquids inside of our thermometers. Um, and there's a video, um, go ahead and watch that uh, in, in the description about how thermometers work and then come back and continue my notes. So there are multiple temperature scales that have been invented through the years. Um, the Fahrenheit one was the first one invented and some of us are still using it because it was first and we don't like to change. Uh, unfortunately, like a lot of first things, it wasn't in. Uh, it wasn't great. I mean, it was the first one, so nobody had really done it before. But it was not an ideal um, a system, and we've come up with better ones since then. But some people um, are unwilling to change. Fahrenheit was not actually a scientist. He was a glassmaker. He was making thermometers for people, and people kept saying, "Hey, why don't you put some kind of standard scale on this thing?" So he figured out a standard scale. Um, he put some salt in water because he knew that if you added salt to water, uh, it would make the water freeze at a lower temperature. So his particular mix of salt water froze at a particular temperature, which he called zero degrees. Um, as a result, the freezing of pure water on his scale is not at zero, but at 32 degrees above zero. Um, and then he took the thermometer and he stuck it in a person's mouth and he took a person's temperature and he decided to call that 100. So to make any temperature, to make any scale, what you need is two reference points uh, that are relatively easy, um, consistent reference points. And then you need to decide how many degrees or whatever are going to separate those. So his two were his uh, freezing salt water bath, which he called zero degrees Fahrenheit, and then a human body, which he called 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is why to this day, if you take your temperature in Fahrenheit um, of a human body, it's very close to 100, right? 98.6 is considered standard human um, temperature. So those were just two reference points. Uh, the problem is that human temperature does in fact vary some, so using humans as a reference point is a little challenging. And to get just his particular salt water bath um, and then finding a way to cool it down until it freezes is, is challenging. Um, so Things that are much easier to deal with, namely water, which of course is extremely prevalent on this planet, right? Covers a large percentage of the surface of the planet and is necessary for all of us to survive. We have to drink water on a regular basis. Uh, water would have been a better reference point, but in his system, water freezes at 32 and boils at 212. So along came an actual scientist who decided to base his on water. So in the Celsius scale, which was developed only about 20 years later, but again, second is second, and some people won't come off of Fahrenheit. Um, water freezes at zero, it boils at 100. It was, it was entirely based on water. What's the freezing point of water? What's the boiling point of water? We'll use those as reference points. Um, the weakness of the Celsius scale is that it's still a relative scale. There's still a zero set somewhere. You can end up with negative temperatures, which doesn't make a lot of sense if you're relating temperature directly to energy, because then a negative temperature would mean negative energy, which isn't possible. And so um, it, it's hard to understand what is the kinetic energy of the molecules when your temperature is negative five degrees Celsius. Uh, that, that's difficult. So they went on um, further, and part of the reason uh, in Celsius's defense that he, that he set water freezing at zero was they had no concept of the bottom of the temperature scale in his day. It, uh, every time they thought they had something as cold as you could get, they found something colder. Um, Lord Calvin was actually a scientist who was one of the people who figured out for the first time, 100 years after Celsius, 
um, what the coldest possible temperature would be. He didn't get there, um, but he used um, a relationship, which we'll talk about in chapter 15, Charles Law. He used a relationship to calculate what that coldest possible temperature would be and concluded that that coldest possible temperature would be when the molecules themselves, remember temperature, thermal energy is the kinetic molecular energy. So it's the kinetic energy of the molecules. So you can slow them down and slow them down. You can take energy out and slow them down and slow them down. But eventually, you're going to slow them down to a stop. And when those molecules stop moving, they have no kinetic energy. And therefore, the temperature is as low as it can go. You can't go slower than stopped. It's not possible. You go backwards, then you're actually moving again, right? That's that's positive energy. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So even if your velocity is negative, you have positive energy. So you can't go slower than stop. They finally figured out what zero was. Zero is 273.15 uh, degrees Celsius below uh, the temperature at which water freezes. So Calvin created what we call the first absolute temperature scale. Zero means zero. And he set zero all the way down there at that coldest possible temperature. So zero Kelvin means zero energy. And if you go from 50 Kelvin to 100 Kelvin, you've doubled the temperature, you've doubled the energy. It's a true direct temperature scale. The problem is all the temperatures that we use on a daily basis are therefore very large numbers because everything around us is full of energy. So water freezes at 273 Kelvin and it boils at 373 Kelvin. Calvin uh, appreciated the fact that he was the third temperature scale and things were already getting complicated and confusing. So he, um, although he moved the zero down 273 degrees, he decided to keep the same size degrees. So just as there's 100 degrees between zero and 100 on Celsius' scale, uh, between water freezing and water boiling on Celsius' scale, which is from zero to 100, there's also uh, those same 100 degrees between water freezing and boiling on the Calvin scale. So he kept Celsius's size of degree. So we actually have four temperature scales today. We have the Celsius, the Calvin, the Fahrenheit, and then for the people who continue to insist on using Fahrenheit, uh, they developed an absolute scale that used Fahrenheit size degrees. So that's called the Rankine scale. Um, it's got a zero at negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit, which is absolute zero in Fahrenheit size degrees. Um, and just as uh, there's 180 degrees between freezing and boiling on the Fahrenheit scale, there's 180 degrees between freezing and boiling on the Rankine scale, but it's from 492 to 672. So those are the temperature scales. What I want you to know on the test is uh, the freezing and boiling temperature of water in each of the three. Uh, first three scales. I, I care less about the Rankine. Celsius is very important. Calvin is very important. And Fahrenheit is the one we live with here in America, so it's important as well. So again, this absolute zero, as I've already discussed, the temperature at which the kinetic energy is no longer present in the molecules. We have uh, never been able to actually reach this temperature. We have gotten extremely close, fraction, fraction, fraction of a degree away, but it's extremely difficult uh, we live in a world full of energy. So to get something down to zero energy, uh, when the less energy you give it, the more the world around it that's full of energy wants to give it energy. I liken it to trying to dig a dry hole in the middle of a lake. Right? The deeper you get in your hole, the harder it is to keep dry because you have more water. You have water all around you, and the deeper you get, the more gravity wants to pull it down into the hole. So uh, very, very difficult to reach absolute zero. Uh, but again, we have done the calculations. We have calculated this would be when the gas molecules would have no energy at all. Uh, therefore, their volume would go to zero because they, they, there would be no energy in the molecules to, to push against the, the proverbial edges of the balloon and blow the balloon up and keep it at some volume. So um, absolute zero is the coolest. They, they have t-shirts with that, that uh, image on it, that lower left image. So you can get one of those if, if you want to. This picture on the right is um, of a man by the name of Dewar, who was one of the individuals trying to reach absolute zero, trying to reach these very low temperatures. Um, and they did this by trying to liquefy gases, um, the lightest gases like hydrogen and helium, they would try to liquefy. And those liquefy at just a few degrees above absolute zero. 
And so it was a, a great race at one time in science to try to reach the lowest possible temperature. So again, matter does not contain heat. Matter contains energy. It's thermal energy that is in the matter. Heat is what we call it when that energy is transferred due to a temperature difference. So you think about a paperclip, right? A paperclip has molecules in it, and that paperclip has a certain temperature, so those molecules have energy. Um, and those molecules will have that energy and you can touch the paperclip. And if you are a significantly different temperature from the paperclip, warmer or colder, energy will either flow out of you and into the paperclip or out of the paperclip and into you. Um, one thing you can do with the paperclip is bend it back and forth and back and forth. And by means of bending it, you're creating friction inside the paperclip. Uh, you are introducing kinetic energy by moving it to create that friction. And so the paperclip will get warmer. Um, and if you bend it back and forth enough times, it will snap. And then if you touch the end that you've just snapped, uh, you'll find it to be quite warm. But again, the key is to understand that it is the transfer of energy due to a temperature difference that we call heat. That is the physics definition of heat. Unfortunately, it's not the everyday definition of heat. Um, way too often, we use the word heat uh, to mean thermal energy, and that is not correct in a, in a physics sense. Um, even I make that mistake uh, at times. But for our purposes in this class, it is the transfer of energy due to a temperature difference that we're going to call heat. We're going to call the stuff inside an object that makes it a certain temperature, we're going to call that thermal energy. And if an object has a lot of thermal energy, its temperature is higher. If it doesn't have very much thermal energy, its temperature is lower. Uh, but the heat is the transfer, the transfer. And there's, again, a little video to talk about the difference between heat and temperature and thermal energy. A very good video. They, they relate this concept to money um, and the idea that a bucket full of $1 bills um, is potentially worth more than a single $50 bill would be. Um, so go ahead and watch that video. Again, it's one of those Eureka videos. Very helpful to try to get uh, at the subtle differences between heat and temperature and thermal energy, which they, they are different things and we need to understand that as we move forward in this course. So our symbol for this transfer of energy is called is Q. So heat's symbol is the capital letter Q. Again, does that make any sense? Maybe not, but we're using H and E and A and T for other things. So we need a new symbol for heat and Q is available because a few words start with Q. Um, heat or thermal energy, both of them are, are energies, right? Heat is the amount of energy transferred, so it's still an energy. Um, these things are measured in various units. Um, it would be nice if there was only one unit for energy, but there's not. And one of the reasons there's not just one unit is because we didn't quite understand uh, that energy of motion, which we learned about in chapter eight, kinetic potential energy, energy, mechanical energy, that's what we call that, mechanical energy, thermal energy, um, acoustical energy, which is energy of sound, light energy. We didn't realize all of these were the same type of energy at one time. Now we understand they're all the same type of thing, but we already had different units for all these different sections of energy. Um, and many of these units relate to how one goes ahead and measures energy in those areas. And so no one wants to give up their units of energy, right? Uh, we talked about joules already. That's what we used uh, back in chapter eight the mechanical energy we measured in joules, and a joule was a kilogram meter uh, squared over seconds squared. So that was the definition of a joule. Uh, the calorie, as we talked about the caloric theory, a calorie with a lowercase c is the amount of energy it takes to heat one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Uh, a BTU, which stands for British Thermal Unit, is the amount of energy to heat one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. So Fahrenheit degrees are smaller than Celsius degrees, but pounds are way bigger than grams. And so a BTU is much bigger than a calorie. A kilocalorie is simply a thousand calories. A calorie with a capital C is also a kilocalorie. It, it, I'm not gonna go into the story. It involves this, it involves the fact that the government dictated that we have to say how many calories 
are in various things and uh, lowercase c calories are called scientific calories and they are very small. So if we would label our food items in scientific calories, this would say 120,000 calories per serving and that would freak people out. So we have what they call um, food calories with a capital C, which are really kilocalories. So they just you know, divide it by a thousand and, and still call it calorie. And then they capitalize everything. So you can't really tell which one it is. Frustrating. Uh, therms is another unit. Uh, if you look at your natural gas bill, um, you will see that you are charged for natural gas in terms of how many therms of energy the gas would produce. Again, James Jewell, as we discussed uh, in the earlier chapter, was the one who showed the equivalence between thermal and mechanical energy through a very carefully designed experiment with his very good thermometers showing that the mechanical potential energy and this um, thermal energy were actually um, being transferred and were actually equivalent to one another. Again, things move, thermal energy flows from hot to cold, from high temperature to low temperature because of the collisions uh, and the transfer of momentum. Remember the momentum is conserved um, and then energy, translational kinetic energy is also transferred because that's also dependent on mass and velocity. Um, how quickly the energy is transferred has everything to do with how big the temperature difference is, okay? And this is something actually that Newton was the first to articulate. And it's called Newton's law of cooling, although it could just as easily has been called Newton's law of warming uh, because it's true in either direction. But what it tells us um, in a very simple way is that the rate, this capital R stands for rate, the rate at which energy is transferred, how much energy transfers is proportional to the difference in temperature. So what does this mean? Well, this means that if um, the outside of my body, right, the, the inside of my body is 98.6, but the outside of my body is not. The outside of my body is cooler than that. So let's say that my skin is 78 degrees and let's say that the, that the room I'm in is 75 degrees. Um, so I touch a surface, I touch the counter in my kitchen and it's 75 degrees and I'm 78 degrees. So technically those are different temperatures, right? There should be an energy transfer because the temperature is different. But the difference is only three degrees of Fahrenheit. So the rate at which the energy flows out of me and into the counter is going to be slow because the temperature difference is small. On the other hand, I cooked chicken um, chicken strips for my lunch today and I preheated the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit before I stuck the chicken in. Now, if I reach inside that oven when it's on and preheated and I touch the inside surface of that oven, um, that's 400 degrees Fahrenheit. My hand is still 78 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a temperature difference of over 300 degrees. So the rate at which the energy is gonna flow from the inside of the oven to my finger is gonna be way higher. A fast rate of flow, the energy is going to come into my cells very quickly. My cells are going to get over full of energy too fast. It's going to destroy and damage my cells due to a rapid increase in temperature. And I'm going to burn the tips of my fingers and cause myself irreparable harm. Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, I can stand in the shower and the hot water can feel good without burning me because it's not 300 degrees hotter than me. It's only 10 or 20 or 30 degrees warmer than my outside body temperature and therefore it feels good. Same thing on the flip side, right? Uh, you know, I can put my hand in front of the air conditioning vent and feel that cool air blowing on my hand and that feels good and it's cooling my hand and that's wonderful. Um, if I go outside in the winter and plunge my hand into the snow, um, it becomes unpleasant very quickly, right? The air coming out of that air conditioner is maybe 60 degrees, my hand's 78 degrees. I go outside, stick it in the snow, the snow's less than 32, right? So maybe that snow's 30 degrees, my hand's 78 degrees, much bigger temperature difference. Um, this is why ultimately burning yourself on something hot and burning yourself on something cold, frostbite, uh, actually feel the same. Uh, because the same thing, it's your cells dying because energy is transferring in or out of them too quickly. Um, so we, we talk about a, a, the burn of a frostbite as well as the burn of an actual um, high temperature burn as well. And all of this is due to Newton's law of cooling, um, the fact that the rate of flow is, is proportional to the difference in temperature. 
So there are three ways in which energy is transferred, right? Three ways. Um, we've probably maybe learned these in grade school um, science class. It's, it's a topic they like to talk about. Uh, the first one we're very familiar with, we talk about this, is conduction, right? It's the way most of us think of energy transfer due to temperature most of the time. It's actually touching. Two things touch one another, energy is transferred, right? You put a hot piece of metal in water and you see steam, you know, the water boils and, the, and the, the, the object creates this steam and we know that the metal is cooling down and that the water is warming up. The other two are a little bit more subtle. There's convection, uh, which is actually energy transfer due to the movement of fluids. Uh, and we just talked about fluids in chapter 13. So those principles are gonna be very important with our discussion of convection. And finally, radiation, which is actually the result of uh, electromagnetic energy being transferred uh, through what we typically refer to as light. So we're gonna go into each of these three in a little bit more detail. First of all, conduction. There we go. Um, so again, this is the one we have been talking about so far. This is the contact. This is the collision, right? Here I've got just a little simple diagram reinforcing this is the molecules, right? The red one is, is hotter. It's going faster. It's moving along at a higher, temp a higher velocity because it's at a higher temperature. It crashes into the colder, slower one. And after that collision, the slower one is going faster and the faster one is now going slower. It's a momentum collision, transfer of momentum, transfer of energy, therefore effectively a transfer of velocity, a transfer of thermal energy, and a transfer of temperature, ultimately. Um, so it's this collision, right? And some materials collide well, and some materials don't collide as well. The things that collide well, we call conductors. They're good at it. The things that do it poorly, we call insulators. They're bad at it. Um, watch a little video, forgot to put the little note on this slide, but go ahead and pause my video, go watch a video, um, again, it's a Eureka video about conductors. It will talk about the process of conduction. It will also talk about why metals are so good and plastic and wood is not so good. So go ahead, pause me, go watch that video. The, the link is in the description of the YouTube video and then come back and continue. So here's the table from, from our book of all, a bunch of, not all, but a lot of materials and their, um, their thermal conductivities, which can be reduced to a number, right? How many joules per second per meter per degree Celsius, okay? So again, uh, the, the bigger the temperature difference, the faster the energy will flow. The more time you give it, the faster the energy will flow. Um, and um, yeah, the, the thinner the object is, the faster the energy will flow as well. So air is a very good insulator. Air is a good insulator. It does not conduct very well, mostly because the molecules are so spread out, they have trouble running into each other. Um, metals are very good conductors. So you see here we've got aluminum and brass, which are both um, a thousand, almost 10,000 times uh, more conductive than air is, right? So this is why we think that metals are cold, right? Because when we touch the metal, the metal being a good conductor and us being warmer than room temperature, uh, when we touch something that's metal, energy is going to flow out of us and we're going to feel that, right? If you were sitting in my classroom right now, I'd tell you to touch the metal part of the desk and it would feel cold. I'd tell you to touch the desktop and it would not feel as cold. And then we would discuss the fact that our desks have been sitting in this classroom for uh, days, weeks, months, years. And so the whole desk is the same temperature as the room. The whole desk is the same temperature, but the metal feels colder because it's a better conductor. So um, air is a good insulator simply because it's very spread out. And most of the other things that are good insulators are good insulators because they have a lot of air in them, right? Um, cellulose is, is simply a fancy word for um, paper. So uh, Cellulose insulation is simply shredded paper that's kind of puffed up, right? Loose fill, uh, there's a lot of air inside of it. Uh, cork board, again, has lots of holes, lots of air inside of it. Uh, styrofoam has pockets of air inside. Any kind of, of parka or coat or um, even fur that animals have, there's lots of air inside of it. That's what makes it a good insulator versus, again, these metals are uh, good conductors. Water falls somewhere in between, okay? So water is 10 times, 20 times more conductive than air, 
uh, but a lot less conductive than metal. So water is kind of the in between. Now, some people think, wait a second, when I, when I get out of the water of a swimming pool, I get cold. What's going on there? Well, that's a different phenomenon. We're going to talk about that more uh, later on in this chapter. Uh, but that is not because of the conductivity of water uh, that you get cold when you climb out of the swimming pool. So here's just the equation uh, to stick all those numbers into. Um, again, Q is how much energy is actually going to flow. What's the heat flow? Um, we've got the conductivity, capital K. We've got how big of an area, right? How much space are you going to um, have covered with this? I, I, I think of this in terms of windows, right? Do I have a big three foot by three foot window? More energy is going to flow through that window than if I have a little six inch by six inch window, right? Um, how much time are we considering? And of course, what is the difference in temperature? And then all, all of those things would increase, right? The larger the conductivity, the larger the window, the more time, the bigger the temperature difference, all those are gonna increase our flow rate. Uh, the one thing that's going to decrease the flow rate is how thick the object is, right? Uh, thicker window, we're gonna have less energy flow through it because it's, again, it's, it's kind of a domino effect as we saw in the Eureka video, it's a domino effect. The thicker the window, the longer the domino chain, the longer it takes the energy to flow through. So here, uh, just a real quick example, and there's nothing real fancy about this math. You just gotta plug the numbers in. The only thing that's challenging is to get all your units right. So if we're gonna do, um, go back to that, that chart a couple of slides ago, the conductivity chart is, um, was given in BTU uh, per, square feet instead of square inches or per foot instead of per inch. So we got to convert all our inches to feet and, and, and things like that that you've got to deal with. So again, this is our equation. We go ahead and stick in that the conductivity of glass is 0 0.5. The, um, the area of our window, 36 inches is three feet. Three feet by three feet is nine square feet. Uh, in eight hours is the time that we were asked to calculate, and then the temperature difference is 30 degrees, right? 65 degrees inside, 35 degrees outside. Um, and then the thickness of the glass uh, was given in inches, so we gotta convert that to feet so it becomes an even smaller fraction of a foot. Um, but we still discover a large number of BTUs will flow out of our three foot by three foot window in eight hours. Um, um, that's because it's a single pane of glass, an eighth of an inch thick. This is why we have double pane glass, right? There's a, a pane of glass, and then there's a, a, a gap that's full of air or xenon or some other gas that's a good insulator, but is transparent. And then we have a second pane of glass. And so the glass traps the gas between it, confusing glass and gas, uh, but the two panels of glass trap the gas in between, and that provides much greater insulation. In fact, there are triple pane glasses, there, there could be quadruple pane glasses. Uh, you go further and further to increase uh, the insulative properties and decrease the energy flowing out of your windows uh, during the winter, and therefore, consequently, the energy that has to be reintroduced into your house and uh, energy that has to be uh, purchased somehow to keep your house warm. So when we talk about insulating things in a very practical sense, you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or Menards, they'll talk about the R value of insulation. So all you do for R value is you basically flip over that previous uh, conductivity calculation, right? When, when we talk about insulation, that's the opposite of conduction. So we want to know what is, um, how, when, when is it bad conducting and good at insulating. So instead of doing K times all that other stuff divided by L, we do L divided by K. So the thicker the material, the higher the R value, the better the insulation. And the smaller the conductivity, the larger the R value, the better um, the insulation. And so you go to the store and they'll show you the pink fiberglass insulation, which is really mostly air, and it'll have a certain R value. And then they'll say, well, you can put two layers of this in and it will double your R value. And then they'll tell you that your attic should have R40 to R60 for uh, reasons we'll talk about in a moment as we get to the second method of heat transfer, why your attic needs to have a better R value and your walls doesn't have to be quite as high. So why is it that your attic needs the best R value? Well, that's because of the second method of heat transfer called convection. And convection is the transfer of energy through fluids um, it's not really hardly as much about energy transfer as it is about matter transfer. 
matter is actually moving. But since we're moving the hotter matter to a new place, the energy is going with it and it's being replaced by colder matter. And so the matter is the same in both cases, right? It might both be gas or both be liquid, uh, but the energy content is different. So what it appears to happen is that the energy moves when in reality, it's the matter that contains the energy that is moving. So here we have a simple diagram of a pot of water boiling over a fire. And this is a great example of what we're talking about here. So the fire at the bottom heats up the water, the water uh, being a fluid or, or being any material really, when it is heated, it's going to expand. So then we get water that is less dense. It, it spreads out, it takes up more space for the same amount of mass. That means its density goes down. We have less dense water on the bottom, the water at the top has not heated up. It's further away from the fire. It hasn't changed. So we have colder, denser water at the top, less dense water at the bottom. And because it is a fluid and it is capable of flowing, as soon as there's a density difference, those two objects are going to switch spots. Okay. If those objects were solids, right, if we had a column of metal blocks and we heated the bottom one, it would expand. It would become less dense. And the one on top would be colder and more dense but solids don't flow. So you wouldn't get a switching around of the blocks of metal, but you do get a switching around of the water. The hot water rises up because it's less dense. The cold water sinks down. Um, and of course this process keeps going. So when the cold water gets down here, it warms up and pretty soon it's hotter than the hot water at the top. And so it rises and the previous hot water sinks down because it's now cooler and we keep doing this. And um, this is why we do it in the kitchen because now all this water is going to be very close to the same temperature. So we can stick something in the pot of boiling water and be assured that it's going to cook evenly and it's going to not get too hot either because the water can't get above 212 degrees Fahrenheit before it boils off. So this is what convection looks like, whether it's a liquid or whether it's a gas, the same process is happening inside of the sun. Uh, the source of the sun's energy is fusion in the center of the sun. So this happens in the center of the sun and the energy reaches the surface by this same process because the sun is a giant ball of plasma, which is um, a fluid, a gas-like fluid. Um, so again, another video, go ahead and uh, pause my, my lecture here. Go watch the Eureka video on convection. It's extremely um, helpful and, in, and, and good at explaining um, what is going on here, why hot air balloons rise, why our furnaces are in the basement, all of that good stuff. Go watch that video, then come back and I'll talk some more. So really this is all about Archimedes' principle. Okay, Archimedes' principle, which we learned back in chapter 13, an object is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Um, so this hot liquid is going to be buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the cold water um, that could be there instead. And that's why the buoyancy force is bigger than the weight force and the hot liquid rises up. Um, really, that's what's going on. Um, and, and this happens in winds, and I got some images here on this next screen of what's going on with the wind. So um, the sun comes up, the sun heats up the ground, the ground heats up the air above the ground, the ground gets, uh, the air gets warm. As it gets warm, it rises and you get cooler air that comes in to fill in. And you might think, well, why isn't all the air rising? Well, because the land heats up in a different way than the water heats up. Um, remember, we talked way back at the beginning about this idea of different types of molecular energy. Uh, land and sand have very low specific heat capacities. They warm up very quickly um, because they can't hold very much energy and therefore their temperature rises quickly and they heat the air above them. Water can hold a lot of energy and so the sun beats down and puts just as much energy into the water, but the water's temperature doesn't go up as quickly, therefore the air above it does not warm up as much. So we get the warm rising air over the land during the day and we get a cool breeze off of the ocean or off of the lake. And if you've ever spent any time by a large body of water, you know that during the day you get cool breezes off of the water if you're on the beach, for example. At night, it's a very different. At night, the sun goes down and the land cools off and the ocean cools off, but slower. And so now we have warmer air over the ocean and the ocean air rises and we get a land breeze at night. And if you've ever spent the night on a boat near the shore, you know that you get cool breezes off of the shore during the night. Um, 
because this this whole process gets reversed because again the, the land heats up quickly but cools down quickly the ocean warms slowly but then also cools slowly as well and this happens on a whole planet level as well um, creating the wind patterns which again matter much less to us today with engines and uh, that sort of thing but back in the days of, of um, back in the colonial days and the exploration days when they had wind powered ships this was extremely important uh, information uh, which way the winds predominantly blew so that you could uh, transport your ship in an effective way but these trade wind patterns these westerlies the, the direction the winds blow has everything to do with the fact that the equator gets the most sun and therefore is the hottest and so we get rising air at the equator and falling air um, at the mid latitudes and then you get um, the reverse process as you approach the poles as well. This is just an application. You're not gonna have to do anything with this on the quiz or on the test. Just trying to give you applications of these ideas in our lives. So we had conduction, we had convection, and now we have um, the third one, radiation. And this is transfer due to um, radiation due to electromagnetic radiation. It's the only way we could get energy from the sun. We aren't touching the sun. We're not in a giant fluid with the sun. We get our energy from the sun uh, via radiation. But that's not the only way, right? There's, there's a number of different forms of radiant energy. The visible light is only one of them. Uh, visible light is not even the one that we uh, most effectively absorb as human beings. Um, uh, microwaves, of course, we're familiar with microwave ovens in which we use this invisible uh, electromagnetic radiation to cook food. Uh, ultraviolet is actually one of them that we as humans, um, our skin absorbs very effectively. Infrared uh, as well. We are very good at infrared. That's what we give off uh, as humans and therefore we absorb the best. That's what heat lamps um, are all about. But you can also transfer thermal energy via radio or visible or gamma. Uh, radiation as well. If the object you're shining that radiation on is capable of absorbing it, it will take that energy in and its internal thermal energy will go up and its temperature will go up and the energy will have been transferred via radiation. Uh, as I already uh, touched on a little bit, if you're good at absorbing a particular wavelength, you're also going to be good at emitting. Um, and this goes into details that are um, beyond the scope of this course, but the details that maybe you covered a little bit in chemistry uh, about the electron jumps and how that energy is actually absorbed and released by the atoms and the molecules. And if that electron jump fits the energy of the wavelength, it's going to be easy to absorb energy that way, and then you're going to give off energy that way. So in general, um, you give off radiation that corresponds also to your temperature. So colder things give off longer wavelengths, hotter things give off higher, shorter, higher energy, shorter wavelengths. Um, for waves, electromagnetic waves, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. We as humans absorb and emit infrared radiation. The best heat lamps warm us up um, after we get out of the shower. And in the total dark, you can use infrared um, glasses or goggles to be able to see people because they actually glow, right? Uh, sometimes people talk about heat cameras. Heat cameras are really just looking in the infrared part of the spectrum and people give off a glow uh, based on their infrared radiation. On the other side of things is the idea of reflection. Um, if you reflect the energy, then you are not absorbing it. It's just bouncing off of you and going back out. So light things and shiny things reflect the energy. Uh, and so that is a method of insulating something from a radiant energy perspective, is that the radiant energy will reflect off, will bounce off and not be absorbed. Um, on the other hand, dark colors tend to absorb that energy instead. So again, the whole um, clothing uh, recommendation, right? You wear white clothing uh, between Memorial Day and Labor Day. That's when it's sunniest. That's when it's brightest. That's when you don't want to be absorbing extra energy from the sun. And then you wear darker colors in the winter when you would like to absorb some extra energy because you tend to be cold. So that's conduction, convection, and radiation, the ways energy is transferred. 
Now we're going to get into some of the mathematics of how to actually calculate the amount of heat transferred. Um, and this is where we come up with this idea of specific heat. Um, each different material is unique in terms of how much energy it takes, how much energy it can hold, uh, how much energy it would take to increase its temperature. So we call that the specific heat of the materials. Um, specifically, specific heat is defined as the amount of energy to make one gram of the material go up by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. Remember, those are the same size degrees as we talked about earlier. So this is a uniquely identifying uh, aspect. It's almost like a fingerprint for humans, right? We can identify materials based on what their specific heat capacity is, and that's actually a pretty easy um, test for us to do in the laboratory of these various materials. So um, we talked about it in words on the previous slide. Mathematically, we define specific heat in the same way, but this is what the math looks like. How much energy or how much Q, how much heat does it take? So you have the heat on top of the specific heat calculation. How much energy is it going to take? And then you divide it by how much mass, right? For each piece of mass, we're gonna need this much energy. And for each change in temperature, we're gonna need this much energy. Um, so typically, we, um, we, we've been given this specific heat, and so what we want to know is how much energy is going to be required. So if you rearrange this equation and solve it for the Q portion, um, it ends up looking like this. You bring the mass part to this side, you bring the delta T to this side. So you get Q equals the mass times the specific heat C times delta T. Remember, delta is the change in temperature, which is a good thing to remind ourselves that Q is heat, and heat is how much energy is going to be moving due to a change in temperature, right? There's always gotta be a change in temperature. Um, otherwise, this isn't really um, defined as heat. So when you look at this, if you think of the delta as capital A, then you've got CAT, which is cat, and there's an M in front of it, so MCAT, right? So that's the way I remember this equation. It's the MCAT equation. It's MC delta T uh, to determine what Q is. So a very simple example here, how much energy is needed to increase um, the temperature of some silver, 25 Kelvin. So there's a uh, chart in your book. Uh, it's on page 683 in the appendix portion of your book. There's a whole chart with a bunch of heat constants on it. Um, you just go to that page, you look up silver, a uh, number of common materials are there. So we were told the mass that we're looking at, we're told the temperature difference, okay? In this case, they told us what the difference is, right? It's a delta T. Um, this is the difference, this is the change. Uh, sometimes they'll tell us that it went from 60 to 85 and we'd have to do the subtraction here. They did the subtraction for us. So we have the M, we have the delta T, we look up the C, and so we got 45 grams, uh, the C, and you gotta make sure that you look that C up and that it's in the appropriate units, right? I looked it up in terms of, um, I took the one that was in terms of calories per gram degree Celsius, right? Because I have grams. Um, if you do it the joules, the joules are almost always joules per kilogram, which you could have done. You could have used the specific heat for joules, but you would have had to convert your 45 into kilograms and you would have gotten an answer in joules instead of calories, which is perfectly okay um, to do it in terms of joules instead of calories. I tend to pick whatever um, uh, matches the units of, of the problem so that I don't have to do any extra conversions. So we stick those three things in, we multiply them together and we get a Q of 63 calories. This is a big deal. Uh, we're gonna do this uh, a bunch of times. This is what our, our lab, for chapter 14 is going to be about, again, there's um, this principle of calorimetry in which we identify unknown materials by finding their specific heat and then comparing them to these charts. So this is a very big idea. Um, and and the, the, the algebra of it and the dividing of it is, is not as easy for me to show on PowerPoint. And I don't have uh, a great capacity to write on the screen as you've learned watching my other videos. So we have a, a number of videos um, on how to do calorimetry that have been done by other people. Um, and, I, and I posted them and I do think it would be very beneficial for you to watch them. You need to know how to do this. They work through it step by step. Um, I don't need to reinvent the wheel when they've done a good job of explaining it. Go ahead and watch those videos. Some of them are kind of lengthy. I know that 
but you need to watch them. You need to understand how to do this mathematics and be able to solve um, these problems. Sometimes they're simple one-steppers like this. Sometimes we have the energy flowing out of a metal and into water. So we have two MCAT equations that we're setting equal to each other. And then you have six variables and only one of them is unknown. And so it gets a little involved. Um, again, watch these videos, um, watch, follow their work, pause them, replay them, start doing your homework. When you get stuck, go back and watch these videos again. It will, it will be very helpful. Um, again, this calorimetry, which I, I mentioned on the previous slide, or sometimes it's called the method of mixtures. We take an unknown, uh, typically an unknown solid uh, that's typically metallic, but not always. Um, we heat it up to a, to a known temperature. The easiest way to do that is to stick it in a boiling water bath for a while, and we know the temperature that water boils at. Uh, and then we take it out, we stick it in some cold water, and we see how much it warms the water up. Uh, again, once the equilibrium is reached, once the water start, stops warming up, we know that both the material and the water are the same temperature. And then we can use calorimetry, this MCAT equation, one for the metal, one for the water, and we can use it to identify a specific heat of our unknown and then try to identify the object uh, based on that. That's a big part of how um, many of the elements on the periodic table were isolated and identified was by using this process amongst others, because this is a unique characteristic of uh, materials. It is a little complicated because um, even mixed materials have a unique um, value, right? So if you get an alloy that's part tin and part copper, it's going to have a specific heat that's not the same as copper and not the same as tin, um, have a unique um, specific heat itself. So again, I, I'm not spending as much time in this uh, PowerPoint on the mathematics. That doesn't mean the mathematics isn't important. It's just um, you're going to watch the other videos to do that, and, and I want to talk about some, some other things, uh, other concepts as well. So water is a very unique material, and it is a very pre prevalent material in our lives. And uh, as we already talked a little bit on the wind slide, water has a very high specific heat capacity. If you went to that chart um, in the back of the book um, where we found the silver value, and you look at the water value, it is um, an order of magnitude 10 times larger than any of the metals uh, that we look at, and many times larger than air as well. So water has a very high specific heat capacity. And if you think about the idea of capacity, that means the ability to hold something. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, the analogy I like to use is, is that of, of moving, right? If you are moving from one apartment to another and you have two friends and one has a motorcycle and one has a pickup truck um, and you ask them to help you move, uh, whose vehicle is going to be more helpful uh, during that move? It's gonna be the pickup truck, right? And um, somebody else might say, well, you know what? It's gonna be much quicker to load the motorcycle, right? We strap one box on the back of the motorcycle and it's loaded, right? That was quick. And that's true, but it, it can't hold very much. It doesn't have a very large capacity. It's quick to fill because it has a small capacity. The pickup truck's gonna take a lot longer to fill because it's gonna carry a lot more for you. It's also gonna take a lot longer to unload at the other end, but the point is you want that capacity, right? You got a lot of stuff to move. So that's what we're gonna talk about here um, in terms of the world's climates and um, how water has an effect, right? A desert, many people think deserts are defined by temperature, and that is uh, not true. If you look up the actual definition of a desert, something qualifies as a desert if it gets less than a certain amount of rainfall per year. It's defined in terms of rainfall. So what really makes you a desert is dryness, not hotness. But dryness and hotness um, are related, and they do go together because of the high specific heat capacity of water. So in a desert full of, say, sand, you've got sand, which has a very low heat capacity, and air, which has a very low heat capacity. So when the sun comes up, it's going to very quickly fill up that sand and that air's ability to hold energy, right? Just like the motorcycle. Sand and air are like the motorcycle. They fill up very quickly. 
And um, you know, if you, if you think of each stage as filling up, oh, now you can get, can fill, go up another degree. Now you fill up, now you can go up another degree. You know, this, this kind of stair step of filling up the degrees, um, the, the sand and the air very quickly shoot up to a high temperature because it doesn't take very much energy to take them to the next degree. So deserts get very, very hot during the day, uh, but, but when the sun goes down, then the desert cools off and it cools off very quickly and it can get actually quite chilly at night in the desert because of that sand and that air is not holding very much energy. So when the sun, the source of the energy goes away, that energy starts to get re-released. And this is, again, the equivalent of unloading the motorcycle at your new apartment. It doesn't take you very long to unload the motorcycle and very quickly it's empty. Um, and the same thing happens to the air and the sand. They cool off very, very fast. And you contrast a desert um, with a rainforest, right? A rainforest obviously has a lot of moisture in it. Um, rainforests are hot during the day as well. The flip side though is that rainforests are very warm at night. Or if you've never been to the rainforest, just think about life in St. Louis where we live when it's really humid in August, right? The sun goes down and you go outside and it's 10.30 at night and it's dark and you think, ah, oh, it'll be cooler because the sun's down and it's not because there's so much humidity in the air, water has such a high specific heat capacity, it absorbs so much energy during the day, and when the sun goes down, that humidity still is holding a lot of energy, and it releases it, but because it's holding so much, it doesn't empty out very quickly. Temperature doesn't go down very quickly. Again, it's like emptying the pickup truck. Water's like the pickup truck. Takes a long time to unload, takes a long time to get it emptied out, and for the temperature to get down. So that's why deserts are so hot during the day and so cold uh, or chilly at night, even in the summer. Why are the seasons late? So again, the sun is what um, regulates the temperature here upon the earth. We receive the vast majority of our energy from the sun and um, the earth is tilted on its axis. And so during the summer, we are facing uh, more toward the sun. We get more hours of sunlight a day. During the winter, we get less. That's why it's warmer in the summer and colder in the winter. But the, cold, the shortest day of the year is the winter solstice, which is December 21st. And so December 21st is the day when the sun is in the sky for the fewest hours. The, uh, the northern hemisphere where we live, um, the winter solstice is December 21st. And so we get the least amount of energy from the sun on that day. However, that is not the coldest day of the year. No, the coldest day of the year is about a month and a half, typically about a month and a half later in late January, early February, coldest part of the winter. Same problem in the summer. Though. Summer solstice is June 21st. Uh, should be the hottest day of the year. We get the most hours of sunlight. We receive the most energy from the sun but it's not, it's not the hottest day of the year. Hottest day of the year is in late July, early August, roughly a month and a half after the summer solstice, just like the coldest of winter is a month and a half after the winter solstice. So why is that? Why are those things late? They're not late on the planet Mars. We've sent rovers there, we've measured the temperature. The hottest day on Mars is the summer solstice. The coldest day on Mars is the winter solstice. That is very consistent. What's wrong with the Earth? Well, the answer is, um, again, water, right? If you've ever tried to go swimming in a pond in May, you find that the water is pretty chilly. Uh, on the other hand, if you go swimming in a pond in September, the water's better, even though the days are much shorter in September than they are in May. Um, the reason the water is cold is in May is because that water lost a lot of its energy over the winter and it hasn't warmed back up yet. Uh, the reason the water is still warm in September is because it spent all summer warming up and hasn't cooled off yet in the winter months. Uh, so water is the great moderator on our planet. Water is what causes summer and winter to be late because on the hottest, uh, on the Day we get the most energy, June 21st, the lakes and the rivers and the ponds are still somewhat cool from the winter. And so a lot of that extra energy is absorbed by the water. But by the end of July, those ponds and lakes and rivers have warmed up 
and therefore uh, more of the sunlight of which we are actually getting less by now, right, than we did on June 21st, but more of that energy goes into the air and therefore the air is hotter. Uh, this flip side in the winter, right? In December, the lakes are still full of energy and that, that energy is released into the air to warm the air up. The lakes haven't frozen over yet. The ponds haven't frozen over yet. They are releasing the energy that they accumulated all summer and they're warming the air and keeping the temperature reasonably moderate even in December. But eventually those lakes freeze over and they don't have any energy left to give and therefore it gets cold. But not till the end of January, beginning of February. Why do people want to live in California? Uh, all you got to do is look at a map of the United States to know that California is next to the largest body of water on the planet, the Pacific Ocean. And unlike the state of Maine, which is next to the second largest body of water on the planet, the prevailing winds blow from over the ocean to over California. So um, the Pacific Ocean never freezes over in winter, and it is a very large reservoir of energy to um, release in the winter and a very large reservoir to absorb energy in the summer. And as a result, you get very moderate temperatures, particularly in Southern California. Northern California has this wonderful current that comes down from Alaska that affects things a little bit more. But in Southern California, you get wind over from over the Atlantic, from over the Pacific Ocean, bringing cool air in the summer and warm air in the winter, resulting basically in a temperature band of basically from 50 to 80 degrees is consistently the temperature in Los Angeles and San Diego. And this is why people uh, like to live there. Uh, the other place in the United States that has something similar is the state of Florida, which has a much smaller body of water, um, the Gulf of Mexico, but still a body of water to its west. And the prevailing winds come from that body over the state. On the other hand, you get a place like Kansas in the middle of the continent, far away from any body of water. Kansas is known for uh, brutally cold winters and also uh, triple digit temperatures in the summer uh, because it has no large body of water um, upwind to moderate its temperatures. On the other hand, uh, places like England and Iceland, which are actually quite far uh, north, much further north in the United States, away from the equator um, have fairly moderate climates due to the Atlantic Ocean being upwind of them. So again, the point of this slide is that water has a huge effect on the world in which we live and it has a moderating effect. And we as humans are only comfortable in a very narrow range of temperatures. And if we did not have so much water on this planet um, to keep the summer from being so hot and the winter from being so cold, it would be much more difficult for us to live as comfortably as we do. So we talked, um, back when we talked about thermometers, we talked about the fact that matter expands when it's heated, and that is true, and gases expand the most, liquids the second most, solids the least. So um, gases, it's the easiest to notice, except for gases are invisible, so that makes it a little bit harder. But the hot air balloon, right? The whole reason a hot air balloon can float um, in a atmosphere full of regular air is because that hot air is so much less dense uh, because heating it with the propane burner um, at the bottom of the balloon causes it to expand and to become less dense than the surrounding air and therefore have an effective buoyancy force uh, that exceeds the weight of the entire balloon. There are a number of demonstrations that if we were in class I would do for you. Um, Again, these are simply demonstrations to show that solids, although they expand a lot less than liquids or gases, do in fact expand um, as well and will allow us uh, to see this effect. And the thermal rate of expansion here, we'll see in a moment, um, thermostats work on the same principle. There's a coil of metal inside of the thermostat uh, that expands uh, when it warms up and contracts when it cools down and that either activates or deactivates the furnace or air conditioner depending on how you have the thermostat set. Um, again, solids do not do it as much, but if you put the solids at extreme temperature variations or if the solid is long enough, 
uh, the effect becomes obvious. Railroad rails are 40 foot long and they're made of metal. And if you don't leave an appropriate gap between each successive rail uh, for the rails to expand into, you will get a situation like this when it gets really hot out because the rails heat up and they expand and they have nowhere to go. And so then they become wavy and then you can't drive your train. Uh, power lines, same principle, a very long piece of metal. Uh, outside in all types of weathers. This is why power lines are hung with sag in them. Railroads have this risk due to the expansion when it's hot. Power lines have a risk due to contraction when it's cold. So if I hung my power lines in August and I stretched them straight from one pole to the next, uh, in February when it gets cold and that metal contracts, the lines would snap right when I don't feel like going out and fixing the lines. So we hang the lines with sag in the summer and in the winter when they get cold, there is extra metal there so that when they contract, there's still enough metal to reach from one pole to the next. Bridges likewise uh, need to expand and contract as the temperature changes. So that's what these funny looking teeth on the bridges are. Those are expansion joints to allow the bridge to expand and contract without fracturing. And thermal pipe joints. When you have a pipe that's going to carry um, steam or something that's very hot through it, steam is usually the thing, although you can have other liquids that um, are transferred at very high temperatures as well. That metal pipe would potentially expand when it gets heated up and that would potentially cause um, the, the joints to open up and leak and that would be very bad, especially if it's steam. Um, and so they put a, a piece of metal over the, um, the joint that they oftentimes heat it up uh, to cause it to expand and they slide it on and then they let it cool off and then it will fit tightly to the pipe and then as the whole pipe heats up, um, that, that, uh, that band around the joint will heat up as well and it will keep that seal uh, tight within the pipe. Here's the chart of linear expansions. Again, this is the mathematics of it. Uh, different materials have a coefficient of linear expansion. Uh, again, this is mostly listing metals. You will notice the metal values are higher than the non-metal. Glass and pyrex are both an order of magnitude lower, 10 to the negative sixth instead of the negative fifth uh, relative to the metals. And even the metal numbers are very small, right? 10 to the negative fifth, that is a very small number. But you take this coefficient and you stick it in with the length. So like I said, if it's a long enough object, uh, the effect begins to become obvious. And then also the difference in temperature. So again, similar to Newton's law of cooling, if there's a small temperature change, the object's not going to expand very much. But if you have a big temperature change, or if you have a very long object, uh, the effect becomes more obvious. Uh, in my classroom at school, I get out the Bunsen burner, which, you know, burns at 900 odd degrees Fahrenheit. So we're talking about a big temperature change and therefore the effect can be more obviously seen. Uh, again, the railroad rails and the uh, power lines are very long things, so a big length. Uh, but this calculation will tell you what the, the change in length will be um, in length units of, of your L. So Alpha simply has inverse temperature units so that those two on either end cancel out and whatever your length units are will be your change in length. So let's, let's take a simple example inside of your house, right? You've got copper pipe to carry the water inside of your house. Um, if your house's temperature shifted by 35 degrees Fahrenheit, so that, that would be a large shift, right? If your house went from 50 degrees to 85 degrees. Um, Usually we keep our houses in a narrower range of temperatures than this. But if we went from 50 to 85, that would be a 35 degree temperature difference. If you've got a two meter, roughly a six foot long straight stretch of copper pipe, um, how much is it gonna expand? Is that gonna be too much? Is that gonna cause the plumbing pipes in your house to crack? Uh, what's, going to go, what's going to happen? So we have this equation. We stick in two meters for our length, 35 degrees Fahrenheit for our change in temperature. We need the alpha that goes with Fahrenheit, which is over here. So for copper, that's 9.5. Stick all of that in, we end up with 6.65 times 10 to the negative four meters. So 10 to the negative four, but it is in meters. So if you convert that to centimeters, it's only 10 to the negative two. So we're still talking less than a millimeter 
um, less than a millimeter of expansion. So don't have to worry about it inside um, with relatively short lengths of copper pipe. But if our temperature difference was bigger or if the object itself was, was longer, right? We're talking here six feet versus a, a 20 or 40 foot railroad rail, um, the effect would be greater. So we talked about everything expanding, but water does not always expand. Uh, water normally expands, but there is a stretch of temperature um, between four degrees Celsius and zero degrees Celsius when water does not expand when you heat it, it actually contracts. Um, and this has to do with the shape of water, the fact that water is very polar molecule and therefore fits together very tightly in liquid form. And then as a solid, it forms these ice crystals. Um, and if you sit down and count in this picture, you'll find there's 14 water molecules on the left and exactly 14 water molecules on the right. And if you look at how much space it takes up, the liquid ones take up less space and the solid ones take up more space. So that tells us that solid water is less dense than liquid water, um, which is why ice floats on top of water uh, unlike other materials, most materials, the solid sinks in the liquid form of the object, um, again, because things expand uh, when they are heated and they melt at higher temperatures. So the liquid is usually then expanded um, and is less dense. And you throw a cold piece of metal in molten metal, a cold piece of iron in molten iron, and it's going to be denser and sink into that uh, molten iron. But not so with water because of its unique characteristics. So even though this is basically the only exception, it's an extremely important exception because again, water is so uh, important to us. So water is densest at four degrees Celsius. As you warm above four degrees, it expands and becomes less dense. As you cool from four to zero, it also expands and eventually freezes into this crystal structure. So this brings us to this idea of water turning from a liquid to a solid. So this is what we call phase change and phase transition as you transition from one phase to another. Um, so this is another section with some mathematics similar to MCAT, but a little bit different um, in which we're going to discuss um, the phase transition. One of the important things to understand is that during a phase transition, the energy uh, is being used not to increase your kinetic or decrease your kinetic, but it is being used to actually change the phase, change the chemical structure, um, change the molecular structure of your material, typically breaking bonds, like breaking the bonds that hold that ice crystal together, or forming those bonds. So the point is the energy is not causing a temperature difference because it's not about kinetic energy change. So this is super important. During a phase change, there is no temperature change. You cool the water down, you cool the water down, you cool the water down till it hits zero degrees. And then you cool the water down some more and it changes from zero degree water to zero degree ice. And that ice will not get any colder until all the water has turned into ice. Uh, and there is no temperature change. You go from zero degree water to zero degree ice. There is no temperature change during the phase change. So we can't have the delta T part of MCAT because there's no temperature change. But we still have the Q part to represent the heat. We still have the M part because you know how much we have is important. Is it one gram? Is it 10 grams? Is it 50 grams? And we still have the constant. Only instead of a C, we have an L for latent heat, uh, which is just physics speak for how much energy does it take to change the phase. Uh, joules per kilogram, joules per or calories per gram, whatever that would be in. So we have two phase transitions. Again, we're, we're talking merely about solids, liquids, and gases at this point, not looking at plasmas as much. So going between the solid and liquid, if we go from solid to liquid, we call that melting. And if we go from liquid back to solid, we call that freezing. So this transition um, is called the latent heat of fusion, right? Because if you fuse a liquid together to make a solid, uh, that, that's, that's where they get that term from, okay? And uh, we, we think of it most easily in terms of the solid to liquid. 
we think of melting, right? The latent heat of fusion is how much energy we need to melt it, right? We all know that we have to put energy into an ice cube uh, to turn it in back into liquid. That part is easier for some reason for us to wrap our brains around. What's harder for us to wrap our brain around is that the latent heat of fusion is also how much energy is released when a liquid freezes into a solid. Energy is released when the liquid freezes into a solid. It becomes of lower energy, so that energy has to leave. Now, we talked earlier about what happens in the winter, right? About when the ponds are cooling off um, but haven't frozen yet, right? The air is cold, the air is below freezing, and the pond water is above freezing, and so the energy is released from the pond to warm the air, right? Hot pond next to cold air, there's a conduction, there's a transfer of energy there, uh, making the pond colder and colder. And when the pond gets down to zero degrees, the energy is released into the air and the pond uh, turns from a liquid into a solid. The boiling condensing point, uh, this is the other end, from liquid to gas, right? Again, we, we think most naturally of going from liquid to gas. We think of adding energy. That's easier for us to wrap our brains around. Um, when you turn a liquid into a gas, you boil it. Um, that temperature, that transition is going to occur, of course, at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and that is called the latent heat of vaporization, the energy it takes to vaporize the liquid. Um, and again, that's what it's required to turn the liquid into a gas, um, but it's also going to be released when a gas condenses back into a liquid. Again, we don't think of that as much. The conditions for that happening, um, Again, we, we can't see the gas, so that's harder for us to, to conceptualize as well. But this energy is in fact released when a gas comes back um, and becomes a liquid instead. So if you think about water boiling in a pot on the stove, right, and you think that you see the steam coming off of the water, uh, the reality is you don't. Steam is invisible. Steam is transparent. Uh, but that white stuff you see coming out of the pot and above the pot is the fact that that water has turned to steam. But as it rises out of the pot, it meets the cool air of the room, the relatively cool air of the room, especially compared to that steam, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So as it strikes that cold air in the room, some of that steam um, transfers energy into that cool air and it doesn't have enough energy to remain a gas anymore, and so it condenses. So you get little droplets of liquid water being carried in the middle of a stream of steam, and so you see that those white wisps are actually liquid water being carried upward uh, by the surrounding steam. So that would be a case of the energy being given back off uh, as it collides with the cold air of the room and the gas turning back into a liquid. So here are the numbers for water. Um, you can do this for a lot of different materials. Again, water is very prevalent and important to us. So we're gonna focus on water as the example that we almost always use but it can be done in, uh, with other materials. So the latent heat of fusion for water is uh, 3.33 times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram. That's a lot of joules. Uh, it's also um, 80,000 calories per kilogram. Uh, these are large numbers. Uh, again, water has a large specific heat capacity, takes a lot of energy to change its phase. Um, the uh, fusion numbers look large, but the vaporization numbers are even larger, right? This was 10 to the fifth. This is 10 to the sixth. It takes almost 10 times as much energy to turn the same amount of um, liquid water to gas as it took to turn that amount of solid ice into liquid. And it, on 683, again, that same page in the textbook is a chart of um, these fusion, latent heat of fusion, latent heat of vaporization values uh, for different materials, as well as the specific heats uh, for different materials like we found for silver earlier on. And again, um, this is going to be some of the math that we're gonna do in this chapter. Um, watch these videos. Um, uh, many times you have to intersperse these uh, Q equals ML calculations with MCAT calculations, right? If I'm heating up some ice and I'm gonna turn it into steam, um, first I've gotta melt the ice, then I've gotta heat the water from zero degrees up to 100 degrees. So that's going to be 
um, a MCAT calculation with a change in temperature of 100 degrees, and then I got to come back and use my latent heat of vaporization to turn the water into steam. So they're multi-step problems, but each step is pretty short and simple. It's either MCAT or Q equals ML, and the key is to, um, to use the chart that they will show you in these videos. Mark where you start, mark where you end on the chart so that you understand how many separate steps you need to do and add together. Um, one of the things that you must understand is that you cannot do MCAT and start with one phase of material and end with another. Uh, it, that does not work. MCAT is about changing the temperature of the same phase of matter, not changing phase. That's what latent heat is all about, which is what we've just talked about. So we've talked about boiling and how boiling turns you from a liquid to a gas, but evaporation is something that is um, similar to boiling, but is not the same thing, right? When, when something evaporates, it goes from a liquid to a gas, but it doesn't do it in quite the same way uh, that boiling does. So um, even though it is a phase change from a liquid to a gas, it, it looks very different. Um, it takes place on the surface of the liquid and it's about not the average, right? When you have boiling, it's because the average temperature, uh, average kinetic energy of the material has reached um, 100 degrees Celsius. Evaporation is about the fact that whenever you have a population, there's an average, but there's also those above average and those below average. So evaporation is about the above average molecules turning into a gas while the rest of them remain a liquid. And what happens when the above average ones leave, the average goes down, right? Um, you, can, you can think of this um, in a classroom perspective, right? If you took, uh, in, in any particular class, if you took the brightest student, the student with the highest grade, and you said, congratulations, you're doing very well, we're gonna promote you to the next class. Um, and then we, we, we take that person out of the room and you, you take the new average of the class, the, the average of the class is going to go down because we took out the highest score um, and therefore the average is going to get lower. And that's exactly what occurs with evaporation. The hot one, the hottest one leaves and that makes the average lower. So evaporation is a cooling process. And we're very familiar with this, right? When we sweat in the summer, um, we get these beads of perspiration on the outside of our body. Um, and those liquid beads of water are exposed to the air. And that water is not boiling, although we might think and feel like we're boiling at times. That's not really what's happening. That water is much cooler than boiling temperature, but some of the drops, some of the molecules in that water uh, turn into a gas and evaporate, and they're the above average ones, which makes the average of that sweat droplet go down. So maybe it came out of your body and it was, say, 90 degrees, um, and then some of the hottest water evaporates. And so the, the temperature of that droplet on your skin goes down to say 87 and your body is still very hot. And so energy is transferred from your hotter body into the cooler sweat droplet. And that takes energy out of your body and cools you down. And then the sweat droplet has worn back up again and some of the sweat droplet evaporates and the process continues and it can continue until all of the sweat droplet has evaporated away with energy being supplied by your body um, continuously. Like I said, sweating is how we do this. At Six Flags, they have the misters that put very small droplets of water on your body, which then evaporate off of your body and cool you down. Um, we talked earlier about how when you get out of a pool, um, you're very, very, um, you, you become chilled, especially uh, say you get out of the pool uh, an outdoor pool and it's windy, right? Because the wind blows away um, the water, the humidity from above the pool and hits you with dry air and that dry air um, hits your body and a lot of the droplets of water on your body immediately evaporate and therefore um, your body suddenly gets this immediate cooling effect and you get chilled. Uh, the same thing can happen in your shower, right? You take a shower, the hot water um, fills up the room with humidity and um, when you turn the shower off and you pull the shower curtain back, you get exposed to drier air in the bathroom and a bunch of the water on your body evaporates it and you can get a chill that way as well. It can cool off a cup of coffee. Um, supposedly, uh, that was one of the original purposes of saucers was that you pour some of your hot coffee into the saucer, 
it would have a larger surface area, there'd be more evaporative cooling, uh, you'd blow on it a little bit, then you'd pour it from your saucer back into your cup and it would be cooler uh, and then you would be ready to drink your coffee or your tea. Condensation is exactly the opposite of evaporation. Uh, it's the same concept, only in reverse. The hot ones left the liquid, leaving the remaining liquid cooler. Uh, in condensation, the, the molecules that can't quite make it as a gas, they don't have quite enough energy to stay a gas, so they turn back into being um, liquid. But when they come back to liquid, they're, they're above average, right? So again, that analogy we used before, if we promote the smartest kid in the class up to the next level, uh, he stays there for two weeks and says, this is too hard. And so they say, okay, well, we'll send you back to your old class. When he comes back to his old class, he wasn't good enough to be up a level. But when he comes back to his old class, what happens to the average in his old class? Well, it's going to go back up because he's still one of the smartest people in that class. And so uh, these molecules are not energetic enough to stay a gas, but when they come back to the liquid, they're way above average for that liquid, causing the liquid to warm up, uh, which again is one of the problems with it being too humid, right? When it's too humid, there's too much water vapor in the air. That water vapor can condense onto our bodies, causing us to warm up, um, making the sweating process that was cooling us down not work as well and it's very uncomfortable for us. So we sweat, dogs can't sweat, so they stick their tongues out of their mouth to create evaporative cooling. Uh, people in Arizona are very proud of the fact that it's very dry there, and so your sweating works very good, um, versus in a humid St. Louis, sometimes we have um, uncomfortable experiences due to the high humidity. I talked about the uh, the evaporation that can occur in the shower and how that can make you cold suddenly. Um, clouds again form due to high humidity, um, air being exposed to um, either a cold surface or colder air. Um, the clouds form when the warm air rises up um, in the atmosphere and expands doing work and using up energy, uh, cooling the air and causing the water vapor to condense out of the cloud. Fog occurs when that water vapor hits a cold surface, uh, again, very typically in the very early morning before the sun has risen, but after the night has passed and the ground has cooled off, that warm air, warm moist air hits the cold ground and creates uh, condensing water vapor near the surface. Um, adiabatic is, um, yeah, we're not going to worry about adiabatic. So how does a refrigerator work? So again, we're talking about heat and temperature and all of those wonderful things. Um, in a refrigerator, you have uh, two parts and it's, it's much easier for us to understand a furnace, right? Where we are introducing um, energy uh, into a system by taking it from somewhere else, right? Burning natural gas, burning wood, uh, using electricity that has come through the wires to generate thermal energy. But a refrigerator has to do the reverse. It's got to take energy away. And it does that through this evaporation and condensation process. Um, inside the refrigerator, we have a heat exchanger um, in, in which there is evaporation taking place. We have some fluid inside of this pipe that evaporates at a nice low temperature. So even though the inside of my refrigerator is nice and cold, this liquid is still able to evaporate at that low temperature. And since evaporation is a cooling process, it's going to absorb energy from the food, from the air inside the refrigerator to do that evaporating. So that takes energy out of the refrigerator, um, which is great. Uh, but now we have gaseous refrigerants. So what do we do with that? Well, we send it into a compressor where we raise its pressure. We squeeze that gas together. Um, by squeezing the gas together, um, we warm it up some, but we also make it feel more like a liquid, right? Liquids are more dense than gases are. The compressor is really why your refrigerator is plugged in, right? We have to do work on the gas or else the cycle will not continue to run. Your refrigerator does not need to be plugged in uh, for the purpose of the light inside, that's just a bonus. It's plugged in because of the compressor. When you hear your refrigerator running, it's the compressor that is running, that is squeezing the gas together so that when it comes out the other side, it is at a um, higher density 
and it will condense at a higher temperature uh, due to its higher pressure. And so out here, the gas turns back into a liquid and in the process releases energy. Remember, evaporation was a cooling process. It absorbs energy uh, from its surroundings, causing its surroundings to cool. Condensation is a warming process. It releases energy to its surroundings, causing its surroundings to warm up. So this coil is inside your refrigerator, taking energy out of your refrigerator. This coil is outside of your refrigerator, usually on the back or underneath, releasing the energy into the air of the room. Um, this is not a process that we get to do for free. We have to introduce energy via the compressor. So say we take 100 joules of energy out of the food in the refrigerator, the compressor adds 30 joules of energy, and then we dump 130 joules into the air of the room. Then the expansion valve lowers the pressure and the whole process starts over. And so the coolant inside your refrigerator is never supposed to come out. It's just supposed to go round and round the loop, transferring energy out of your refrigerator and into the air on the outside. This is effective at cooling your food, but it also basically warms up your kitchen to a degree. If you didn't want to warm up your kitchen, you could cut a hole in the wall and stick the back of your refrigerator outside. That way the extra energy would be dumped outside instead of into your kitchen, um, in, in which case you have just turned your refrigerator into a giant window air conditioner, right? Because that's this is the same process that we use in our air conditioners, in our car air conditioners. There's a coil inside, a coil outside. Um, I was always confused as a kid because I was told that big thing sitting outside was the air conditioner. And I would go out there in the summer and I'd stick my head over the top of it and there'd be this fan blowing. And I was always confused because hot air was blowing on my face. And I was like, what good's an air conditioner that blows hot air? Well, what I didn't understand then, but I understand now, is that outside part is called the condenser because that's where this part is happening. And the fan is blowing air over these coils to make the condensation happen more efficiently and more effectively. And yes, we are dumping all our waste heat outside, but the goal is to cool off the air inside of our house, not the air outside of our house. So the refrigerator works off of this principle of evaporation is a cooling process, condensation is a warming process, and the fact that we can manipulate the temperature at which we evaporate or condensate by changing the pressure. That's how the refrigerator works. Um, it requires us to do work to cause a basically energy to flow the wrong direction. It doesn't take any work to get energy to flow from hot to cold, right? All we'd have to do is open the refrigerator and unplug it and pretty soon the refrigerator be the same temperature as the room. That will happen naturally. But if we want the refrigerator to be colder than the room and stay that way, uh, we've got to put work into the process. So here you see the heat exchanger on the back of the refrigerator. This is the condensation side of things. Um, and here you see the compressor that is powering uh, the whole process. Heat pumps do a similar thing. They make use of um, cool air from the deep in the ground and they use this process to effectively condition the air inside of your home. The problem is um, if it gets too hot or too cold or um, if it's too humid outside, the heat pump will not remove the humidity from your house. And so uh, they like to use these in places where the temperatures aren't as extreme, like we discussed in San Diego, uh, but in places where the temperature uh, varies by a lot more and in, especially in places where the humidity changes, um, this is not enough and, and we prefer the, the air conditioning system. All right, I know it was a long chapter. Uh, maybe it took you a couple of different times to watch all of it, but that's the end of chapter 14. See you next time with chapter 15.